Sorry for the delay. Yeah, he's fine. You can applaud. That's right. Thank you. Let's see some enthusiasm out there. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Lerner, and I am the Joanne McGrath Executive Director and CEO of the museum. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you to this conversation with Outburst artist Devin Reynolds. You can applaud. Um, I hope you uh, got a chance to view some of the slides um, about upcoming programs because we have some great upcoming programs. I just want to mention one in particular, and that is that we are having a conversation with um, Mr. Wash, Wash, <laughs> on May 14th. And um, we are, the, the day will start off with a conversation about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which of course you all know all about, so I don't need to get into that. Um, but after, um, that, that'll be where you get to learn about these things that are all the rage, uh, basically art forms that are digitally based, unique, object, unique digital objects that are uh, allowed to trade in digital art. Um, and then we will have Wash talk about his art. And then we're going to have a party to celebrate the launch of his own NFT, where you get the opportunity to buy it as well. So that's going to be an exciting event. I hope you join us for that on May 14th. And just a word quickly about this um, program tonight. So I'm going to introduce Devin, and then Devin will come up and give you a short presentation, 10, 15 minute presentation about his art. And then we're going to have a conversation. I will be interviewing him and then um, you will get a chance to ask questions uh, for the last 20 minutes. And then we will all go upstairs and have some drinks and talk to each other and talk about how great an event that was. Look at that. So uh, Devin Reynolds um, studied architecture at Tulane University. And then he found his way to art um, through graffiti, sign painting, and punk. Am I making that noise? Um, he was featured in a very prestigious exhibition recently, uh, Shattered Glass at the Jeffrey Deitch Gallery, curated by Milan Frierson and A.J. Girard. He had a residency at the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Let's hear it for Joan Mitchell Foundation. Great. Um, and he was, uh, he will be featured alongside his studio mates in an upcoming article in the New York Times. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Devin to talk a little bit about his work, and then um, I will join him up here for the conversation. Devin. Wow. Th thank you so much, Adam. Um, <clears throat> how's everybody doing tonight? Um, <laughs> sorry, this is my first time um, speaking in front of an audience like this about my work. Um, we tried to upload a video from the office uh, to the slideshow about PowerPoint that didn't go through. Um, <laughs> but we, I ended up settling with this, uh, with this meme. Uh, no disrespect to any abstract expressionist painters in the audience. I love Abex painting. I've done a few myself. Um, this is a, one of my favorite memes from the last couple years on Instagram. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to move to the next slide. I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. It's basically uh, a series of photos of previous previously done works, um, a couple images of the of install shots from my show upstairs. And then uh, honestly, I, I, I feel bad, kind of like a narcissist up here talking about myself. So a lot of the other photos or it will be like uh, just life and like family, friend related uh, people that are close to me, um, some studio shots and stuff. Um, but th this was a painting that I showed with, with Jeffrey uh, at, um, in the Moore building um, during Art Basel this last year. Um, it's a portrait of me and my partner, Savannah. 
and and kind of like a I, I know it might be hard to read a lot of the text but this was a really like a ode to our love and relationship so a lot of the text and um words are from a lot of uh, from a lot of lyrics and songs that i've been listening to um, this was the piece that i showed in the first iteration of shattered glass in la at jeffrey deitch gallery it's a little older work and you can kind of see there's a little transition of uh I guess like stylistic elements in the paintings um even though i've started from the most recent work um this is from a few years ago uh, and you can kind of see get a, get a get a i guess like a good view of how the work has changed and morphed a little bit and i started painting a lot more figurative elements in my pieces uh, this was a, a piece that i showed alongside one of the paintings that's upstairs in my show um, if you guys haven't seen it already, um, I, I showed the two of them with with Jeffrey at uh, at Freeze this year. Oh, here goes another meme. Or uh, actually, this is I, I mean I guess it's meme format, but it's it's a line from The Office, one of my one of my favorite TV shows. And, and I guess I, I put this here really to say like uh, you know uh you know i guess like in reflecting about the show and and really sitting down with adam when we were going over what we might talk about um you know one of the questions that comes up uh i guess for a lot of artists and for myself um is like how or like why do i do what i do um and honestly a lot of the time i have no no idea <laughs> we're just make, making it up as we go in the studio um this is one of the pieces so the, the uh from here on out with the works in the slideshow these are from uh from upstairs in the show it's part of the installation oh. and I, I didn't put any of the photographs in the slideshow but there is a series of photographs that's that accompanies the installation and the painting um, that are documentation of walls and buildings that were inspiration for the work itself. Um, and then uh, from here on out, it's kind of like a lot of fishing photos. So bear with me. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this is a picture of me and a, a, a dear friend, Marty Gonzalez, who I grew, who, uh, Grew up working together on fishing boats uh, in Marina del Rey, um, up in Los Angeles. And uh, anyways, really amazing person. I got to watch him grow up since he was a little kid. I think I was like 16. I, I might have been like 17 or 18 when he started working on the boat. And he was like 10 years old. Um, this is a, another buddy. So it's like such a it's kind of a cheesy photo, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's really at work um, he wasn't posing for this and i don't think he knows he's in the slideshow or that i took this picture this is another buddy another uh youngster that i grew up on the boat with me uh his name is rod uh, he works out of san pedro now this is me last season i i, I up until the last year or two i was still working like semi full time on the boat to make a living and work in the studio the rest of the year um, but, but I still fill in once in a while now. So this was one of the trips I filled in on last year. This is a, a dear buddy, D uh, David Babawi. We used to call him Dr. Dave. He, he was old, older than me by like 10 years. So I grew up working under him on the Betty O and Marina Del Rey. And, um, anyways, I just wanted to put this picture in the slideshow cause it was a really great moment where he happened to be coming down to the dock and I was on the dock offloading fish. And he was going out on another boat and we just happened to cross paths and had a couple minutes to uh, see each other and catch up um, but anyways just a really big influence even though he has like no idea but really big influence in my life um, like while we were working growing up he'd be studying um, to uh to go to his, to go to residency to become a doctor so he'd like be in between uh in between in between spots while we were fishing, like reading his books, getting ready to take tests at school. Um, it's a buddy Rafa, 
he runs a uh, second captain on the boat I work on. Um, getting ready to gaff a yellowtail. There's a yellowtail on the fillet board or hamachi if anybody eats sushi. Um, this is cutting up. I think these are bluefin. These are that's a bluefin tuna. Um, this is probably like I know it says nine twenty six on the stamp, but I think it was like four in the morning. I was really bummed because I had to clean like 150 fish or something by myself because the guy working on the fillet board, um, it, he didn't know how to fillet fish yet. He was kind of green. Um, this is us after the trip on the way home. Rod again, wetting down some yellowtail. And then um, something <clears throat> that I did want to highlight in this talk or discussion was um, – I guess the uh, that it really takes a village, you know, to get some of this work done. And this this was this was an impromptu meet up and talk about my work uh, with two of my buddies that I share. We don't share the same studio necessarily, but we share a building. Um, so this is Mario Ayala, and then in the foreground, and Alfonso Gonzalez Jr. in the background. Um, Mario's got a show coming up with Jeffrey Deitch in New York. And um, Alfonso, he just, if you guys didn't see it, he just had a show at Matthew Brown Gallery in LA that closed a month or two ago. Um, but both incredible artists, really great people, um, and a big reason why I ended up moving my studio to LA. But um, anyways, it was just a really nice moment while we were working on this painting. And they happened to come in. I think Alfonso might have started painting for fun. This is Kiki, this is my dog. <clears throat> We only made it like 15 minutes in Whole Foods and they kicked us out, but we tried, we tried. This is my partner, Savannah, um, and like one of the backbone, like kind of the backbone of my studio operation, even though she has her own art, her own painting practice, which I hope she's not watching this and she better be painting right now. <clears throat> she's at her studio in New Orleans currently, and that's our dog, Lily, who uh, is currently lost, but we're looking for her. Um, she got out in New Orleans a couple weeks ago, and I, I just happened to find that shirt at the flea market, so I had to get it. Uh, a big part of my pra uh, my practice or like my painting uh, is research and books. So this was just a kind of a terrible shot, but uh, this is from our can of books in L.A. in Culver City. Um, but anyways, uh, that's like one of my one of my go to spots in L.A. Um, and anyways, I, I love books. I love Arcana. And I want to say thank you to Lee and Whitney, who are the two owners of Arcana and do such a great job curating books. This is uh this is a picture of Mario again. And we're actually this is in Mario's studio with Wash. I don't know where Wash is at. I can't really see. Where are you at, Wash? Um, and this was just a a, a testament to uh I guess like the moment that we've been living through in LA right now. Um, being able to share space with so many different artists and people from different backgrounds. Um, you know, I don't know why, but something told me to take a picture of this, you know, watching, you know, generational, I guess, uh, generational knowledge be passed down um, from Wash, whom, you know, I don't, he probably doesn't think of himself as our mentor, but um, after the start of this program, after the start of the Outburst program, or before it actually, he ended up uh, moving into my studio with me. And um, anyways, this was just like an average day at the studio, um, talking about each other's work, little impromptu critique session, Kiki again. Um, this is one, one, one of my heroines, favorite artists um, and inspirations, Margaret Kilgallen, um, rest in peace. This is her painting, uh, painting that sign. Uh, and that coincidentally on the telephone box past the door is her late partner's uh, graffiti, Barry McGee. Um, but this was uh, on my first trip to the Bay to go see one of Mario's shows, actually. And he surprised me and took me to this spot. Um, so we just wanted to share that. Um, and, and again, to the village, this was getting ready for freeze. Um, that's Miranda, Olive, and Tyler. And I think Savannah's probably barking at me yelling in the background somewhere to get back to work and stop taking pictures but you know there's definitely certain things that I got to put my hand on um but there's also a lot of things that I need help with at times me and Savannah 
up in the Bay Area loading up the truck. I think that great gate uh, at the on the bottom of the picture um, is in the painting upstairs. It's kind of cool. And then really to end, I just wanted to say Kerry James Marshall and Trenton Doyle Hancock are two uh, two of my biggest heroes in art. Um, and, re you know, two people that are the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing right now, even though I've never met either of them. Um, definitely people that I try to model myself after as far as the type of painting, the scale that I work at, um, and the things that I'm doing. That's really it. Sorry for taking so long if I went over, but, you know. <clears throat> Do you have the clicker with you? There's one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That was um, a wonderful introduction to you as a person as well as an artist. Um, so can you share how your background helped inform uh, your art? Uh. Well, I, I think, um, I wish I had a photo of it. Um, let me see if I could go back. But, uh, you know, I think a, a big part of my, uh, I guess, like the formation of me as an artist growing up, but not being cognizant of it, had a lot to do with my mom. My mom's an aunt, my mother's an antique dealer. Um, my early years growing up, she was primarily selling in flea markets and antique shows. She did like the Rose Bowl, Santa Monica Airport a lot. Um, there was there was a show at John Muir Middle School in Santa Monica. Um, she was like all over the place um, selling antiques. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those things, just like with my parents' music, um, you know, I grew up kind of dreading being having to be a part of it. <laughs> Um, you know, going and like setting up my mom's flea market booths on Saturday nights, being at the flea market all day long at her, at her booth. Um, but somehow, you know, that came back full circle once I started sign painting and getting into art. Um, I, I found that, and like Trenton Doyle Hancock and Carrie James Marshall, Margaret Kilgallen, uh, like one of the common threads between a lot of their work a lot of the people's work that I've been interested in, Ed Ruscha, um, a, a, a big part of it is like archiving um, and uh, looking back, whether that's through art history, um, collecting things. You know, I know Trenton shows like a lot of uh, things that he's collected along the way. Same with uh, Barry McGee is another per big inspiration for me. And, you know, he's another person like archiving, collecting, um, and I think I just had that in my blood, and you and you see that even in the work. Actually, in this in this picture that's up on the screen, you know, like these a, a lot of the walls that I recreated in the studio and then subsequently installed in the gallery, um, they they came from real places that I pass by and see every day. Um, so even though I can't really like take home the whole wall, you know, I'm always photographing. Uh, looking, documenting, um, taking stuff in. But I, but I think it comes back to my mom and like collecting. My dad also collected computer parts and stuff too. Um, anyways. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, it explains why nostalgia mm -hmm. is a big part of your work, especially those um, uh, works w with the text right. in them. I'll see if I could get back to one of those. Our clicker's working very well. I'm, I swear I'm trying my best. Uh -oh. Um, but yeah, sorry, clicker is not working. Do we do we point it at this monitor or the screen or? I don't know. Okay, you have to use your <laughs> memories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. So those works have that convey that sense of nostalgia. Yeah. Why don't we talk while we're waiting for the image to come up a, a little bit about fishing? Because we didn't talk enough about fishing. I oh, think. man, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I guess I got to say this is that when I was putting together your bio for the exhibition for the website, um, 
so much of what I read about you was like, you know, Devin Reynolds was a worked as a commercial fishing boat. I'm like, who cares? He worked as a commercial fishing boat, but it clearly is important to you. And yeah. I, I want to know, like, how does that help inform you as an artist? I don't know. I mean, the fun, the funny thing is, is when I when I uh, when I'm out working, I actually like don't do art related anything while I'm on the boat for the season. Um, so even if I'm there for like two months or three months, um, I, I kind of like have to shut off and compartmentalize like the two parts of my life. Um, and in a way I did that for a while in the studio and made a pretty, uh, I guess, conscious decision not to paint about fishing. Um, and then somehow, uh, the two did get intertwined over the last year. But if anything, I mean, fi oh, thank you, man. Fishing, uh, I think, prepared me kind of like architect. I hate to give architecture school any credit, but because um, <laughs> I kind of ha had a pretty miserable time in school. But, uh, you know, when I, was, uh, when I was on the boat and in architecture school, um, and, and I, you know, I just happened to be, and I'm not saying this to put myself on a pedestal. I, I kind of opted out of using drugs to stay up. Um, and I kind of found that I had like a lot of stamina, like natural stamina to like keep going and keep working under high pressure situations on the boat. You kind of have to, and there's definitely been moments. Um, I wish I had a picture of my buddy Jimbo on the slideshow cause he was there the first week that i started working on an overnight boat fishing for tuna and stuff i actually like kind of had a melt not a melt not a psychological meltdown but physical meltdown because my body couldn't take it and i threw up all over the place while we were filleting fish one night not on the i didn't throw up on the fish <laughs> but i was so scared to show vulnerability to the captain of the boat at the time so i like threw up under the fillet board and um any, anyways uh uh I ended up getting over that, but being able to get through working 20 hour days back to back. And I don't want to make it sound like too extreme, like I was on the deadliest catch or something, because it's not not like that. A little more mellow. But um yeah, uh and there goes I guess the paintings again. But but yeah, they 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 I guess it did prepare me for um I guess for battle in the studio, you know. And and at times I try to shy away from talking about the scale of the works that I do because I don't, I didn't start doing it as like a ego thing or trying to be better or bigger than anybody. I honestly like just had a bigger studio space starting out um, because I was living in New Orleans at the time and that was what was available. And, uh, you know, and also, you know, looking at, you know, the people that inspire me, Kerry James Marshall, Trenton Doyle Hancock, Mark Bradford, um, like one commonality beyond, you know, certain, uh, I guess like stylistic things is, uh, is scale. Um, and most, most of the time, the pieces that I saw from the artist I look up to was in the museum space and it's usually really big work. Um, but that it take, it does take a certain type of, um, I guess <laughs> like a certain type of crazy trying to do some of these pieces at this scale. So I think that's where like the boat uh, kind of comes into play, you know? Yeah. I, I get it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit now about um, the role of nostalgia in your work since yeah. we have the image in front of us? Totally. Um, and, and honestly, I wish I would have put together a little page after this, after this piece just to show um, like where everything came from um, because uh, you know, like the 98 in the middle of the piece, for instance, um, like the inspiration for that came from a photo I found on Flickr on, on the internet, just digging for sign painting photos that I've kind of gone a little overboard over the last year or so archiving. And I've been like archiving uh, movie stills, TV stills, snapshots and screenshots of people's Instagram posts, um, stuff I find on Flickr, YouTube, music videos, Google Maps, Google Street View. Um, so the 98 cents actually came from Flickr. 
um, and I found this really great sign that somebody painted in Wait, San. Can you point out which what ninety eight cents? Oh yeah, the ninety eight. It's like right in the middle of the painting. It's, I know the nine is a little obstructed, but it came from this picture, uh, and I wish I knew who the photographer was or who the sign painter was, but it was this really wacky 98 cent store building. And uh, I ended up not using the way that they painted it in the photo. I didn't use the color scheme, but you know that's where the origin of the 98 came from. And, I, and I've, in paintings past, I was using 99 and, and you see that a lot in people's work you know i think because it's such a familiar um uh, i guess like a familiar motif if you will um in advertising language and in everyday life i know nina chanel uses 99 in her work a lot barry mcgee uses it a bunch um yeah i really i guess a lot of people that have used uh typographical elements in their work but i, I wanted to switch it up and like be kind of silly and use 98 and um you know, and, and, and but but everything in the painting kind of came from somewhere. Um, you know, I I can't really give myself too much credit. Um, you know, even the words that I use in the piece usually comes from a song, a poem, or um, I, I don't really read per se. Even though I'm like a book a book collector, I really collect art books. But I will read while I'm painting, like for inspiration. So the text. Um, in the painting as well as the imagery color schemes and and stuff comes from uh i guess a, a place of nostalgia through music um so there's like this whole piece is like riddled with uh songs that i listen to pretty frequently um can you talk about the project you did for us here at the museum yeah 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 totally um let me see if i can find it. there we go yeah um so with this project you know, it honestly, it started a couple years ago when me and my partner were driving. Well, there's, I guess, a twofold. There was a, a, a restroom, and I wish I had a photo of it. But there's this restroom in our old studio building that had this really crazy, uh, how to describe it. It just had, like, so much paint built up over the brick. And then uh, it was really simple. It was, like, primarily white brick with this blue... A, a ribbon of blue along the bottom like third of the wall and um i did a painting about that like three or four years ago it was just called bathroom painting one or something and there and uh that was the start of me investigating like wall texture and for a, for a while i've had had this idea like oh my god i gotta do a whole series of bathroom paintings never ended up happening or didn't ha hasn't happened yet and then on a trip to L.A. with my partner, um, Savannah, we were going down the 110. I forget which freeway we were going down, but we were go driving down the freeway in L.A. And I was looking at, you know, just this, like, expanse of brick, um, you know, going down the freeway. And uh, I don't really, I can't explain, like, why, but something that really grabbed me looking at it. And, and you know, you see... Um, all the buff marks and things that have been painted over uh, from, you know, like graffiti or whatever, uh, all the marks from cars hitting the side of the freeway. Um, and uh, I something about, in, in, in a way, I guess like an ode back to um, color field painting, something about there being multiple color, m multiple values of the same color. Because a lot of times when you do, you know, fix a wall or like repaint a wall, and I know you can kind of see it in the purple in this photo. Um, and like, you know, you can't really, I don't know if you can really see it in the photo, but when you go up in the gallery, like the blue of the fence versus the blue on the back of, of the corrugated metal is a different color. Um, you can see the blues on the upright column, they change. And, and it's like really subtle things, but something about um, those moments and I think that's what I uh, what I tried to capture in the photography that's that's paired with the installation um, was I just got really obsessed with uh, I guess like these kind of like boring moments that we really look over you know they don't even have text on them uh, but they still have they still have some kind of story I guess 
is is was like a big inspiration um for for where it for where it's coming from and, and you know and i think too I, I really wanted to challenge myself with this project because when, when me and adam did like did a walkthrough of the museum and talked about uh you know sort of like the what the parameters or ideas were for the outburst program um you know one of the th one of the big biggest things that i heard was um you know kind of going outside of what i normally do in the studio or for for a commercial gallery show um which i'm, I'm trying to find the photos of the uh install shots but um my uh you know my other works are a bit more maximalist and busy with information um and I, I really wanted to challenge myself with this to uh try to find peace in letting things go so that was like a big thing for having like the big swaths of color void of figures and text Great. Yeah. um now you often just reference punk just mm -hmm. in our conversations working together tonight um how is that part of your your identity? How is that inform your art? What's that about for you? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I feel like uh, I guess I, I owe it partly to my dad, you know, and then also growing up in Venice, growing up at the beach. Uh, really, like I guess if you grew up from Malibu to Palos Verdes in the Santa Monica Bay. Um, like every kind of like every stop of the way there's like some part of punk punk rock history that's like has a pretty um pretty big hold on that on that part of LA um and uh you know I think one of the first introductions I had to like to punk and metal was going to the Santa Monica High School football games as a kid and um I I, re, I re distinctly remember being really embarrassed that I loved uh, the intro song the band did at the games, and it was Iron Man um, by Black Sabbath. And my I remember my dad bringing me home and putting it on, and he had like this way of teasing people where he like knew that it got under your skin, but he would like put it on, and like I, I wish I could like imitate him right now. Um, I could kind of like hear it in my head, but. Uh, really like he he was a big intro to it with with showing me black sabbath um he was really into body count ice t's um hardcore band um and uh i was kind of like like i don't know how to describe it but i i think because i had my tribe through fishing surfing and skating as a kid i didn't feel the need or i didn't feel the need or know how to go find people that listen to music that i listen to but I was deeply into punk, metal, metalcore, emo music, and like all kind of stuff in high school. But just listened to it in my headphones or like at home on my, in my room. Um, and then when I ended up kind of dropping out of college during my thesis, started painting graffiti. One of the first people who really took me under their wing, as a really as an artist, um, in the studio and out you know taking me painting and like showing me the ropes my buddy connor um who go his he goes by mersa is his art name mrsa and um he he was he was like super punk and then that that connection and us being in the same graffiti crew put me around the the new orleans punk scene and then that kind of like transpired from there yeah and um what about the role of politics or social justice issues in in your work? Um, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, and I was listening to I was as I was like preparing for this today, trying not to get trying to not be nervous. I was listening to an interview that uh, between Trent Doe Hancock and Carrie James Marshall. I forget what podcast it is, but if you type one of their names on Spotify or any podcast app, it should come up. And um, they brought up something in that interview um, that I guess like I tussle with myself, and that's growing, I guess, coming of age as an artist under certain rules or methodologies of painting and representation 
um, that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, they're not not important because they are, uh, but they're not the only way to be. And the first sh museum show that I went to was the traveling exhibition the Rubels put together, the third, 30 Americans. I saw that show at the CAC uh, when it came through New Orleans. And, and I wasn't, I, I don't think I was like fully painting yet. I was still like doodling, but mostly doing graffiti. And, um, you know, even though like there was work in that show that was void of, you know, certain tropes of, of or I guess like certain tropes or iconography or ways of being a black or African-American artist that I, that I saw by seeing, you know, like Kara Walker, Glenn Ligon, Pope L, you know, and like the list goes on, you, you know, even like earlier Nina Chanel's work or Nina Chanel's earlier work. I feel like a lot of that work was, you know, dealing with the black identity in America through a very, uh, like, I don't know what the right word is, but through a very like visceral and um, like, how do you say no hole no holes barred yeah no hole i don't even know what that is i feel like i'm just saying uh saying sounds but um you know that that was like my my intro intro to art was that so you know if you go back to this piece you know you to me like i was still in that you know everything was about my identity and like kind of bleeding it right um you know even like the left on the left hand side called tyrone now and that was really like that was a kind of a joke from uh, or a riff off the erica badu song you know you better call tyrone um but turn that melanin into you know what it says you know that even though like that was something i was thinking about you know like what i was getting at is like this idea of how as i guess like as black people in america and, and other places around the world you know whether you want to or not you know the way in which you're perceived by others and yourself um can uh you know i i guess like uh take away from who you really are you know um and um, I, I feel like over time I've tried to prog not not pr progress, but move in a different direction, you know, where everything isn't like screaming from a mountaintop that I'm black um, and like, you know, going through real shit or ooh, excuse me, excuse my language, going through real stuff, you know, because I don't I don't want to I, I don't want to minimize the seriousness of some of this stuff um, and 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 what, you know, people like Carol Walker um, Glenn Ligon and Mark Bradford, like what they have accomplished and what, you know, what roads they've paved for us to follow them through, um, you know, getting to like my more current work, uh, I think something that interests me was ideas of representation of black and brown bodies, similar to, you know, the way Carrie James Marshall, like, like honestly, in, in, in the, I feel like he's somebody that's been so open about almost having like a war plat, a war path to you know interject a, a very specific and intentional um, message into the museum and into uh, you know the art world. The the crazy thing is with some of these newer works I've been doing is whether or not I want to like political like whether or not the goal is to i guess like tap into some sort of like uh conversation around politics or whatever like part of it is i just wanted to paint a mermaid you know um and it but it also happens to be that we're living in a moment where there's a lot of people that they might not be able to see this as just a mermaid painting but it's a black mermaid it's an african-american mermaid um and, 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 you know, and I, I guess like right now I've been trying to sort of work myself out of falling back on too much of that um, and trying to speak a little bit more about 
like what I really go through every day. Um, and not just the negative stuff, because it's easy to get caught up in that. Um, even though it's important to recognize that stuff, like I also want to just paint me pushing my dad's car. You know, but that's but that isn't there's nothing political about it. I, I honestly I didn't even really want to talk about class or like anything. It just I used to push my dad's car all the time. Because my dad's car used to break down all the time. Same. Yeah. And 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 there is there you know, like I said, the 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 double I guess like the the other side of that is having to push his car is the symptom of some of this stuff that's going on in our country. Um but it doesn't always have to be that reason why I'm painting it, I guess. Does that make sense? Super. Yeah, that was very, mm -hmm. very helpful and very articulate. Um, so why don't we turn the house lights on and start to have questions from the audience and from our digital audience as well. Oh, I knew it. I knew you were going to do it. <laughs> okay, I'm coming over there. <laughs> Wash can't get the mic. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> you can get him back on May 14th. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be locked and loaded. I apologize. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> but, you know, we, we work together on, on this, you know, bringing this outburst together. And when we, we, in the trenches working, I never did get an opportunity to ask you. So I'm asking you now in front of all these people, and I am putting you on the spot. <laughs> okay. What do you, what's the title? What do you call your whole show? The, oh, for the outburst program? <laughs> no, not the outburst program. And that's what the, collectively together, but is there a title for your exposition? How you, how you pronounce that word? Ex exhibition? Exhibition? Yeah, for your exhibition. Uh, do, do each one of your, each time you present your art, do you give oh, it a title? Yeah, like okay. each individual piece definitely has a title. That's actually funny you asked that because, um, you know, looking back in art history and then also contemporarily speaking um like i was just thinking about this yesterday or the day before about robert rauschenberg and trenton Doe hancock and like where rauschenberg had the combines um which were what he type what he called certain pieces um in like the greater body of work that he had trenton Doyle hancock has the mounds um which is something that he uses to call is a word he uses to call not only figures and characters in his in his like world that he's created, but there's also um, certain pieces are them also, and uh, I've been trying to figure that out what that is, but I don't know yet. The, I know that the the show upstairs is called uh, Still Going, I think, or at least I'd, I'd uh, in my it head it would be is. you who called it that. So <laughs> yeah. Don't look or at, at least me. that's what I'm calling it. It's uh, Still Going, but. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but yeah. Uh, can, you, can you say why you call it that? Oh, I mean, honestly, <laughs> there there was a there was a song. I don't remember what the song is called by a rapper by the name of Larry June, and he's got a little catchphrase. He says, "Keep going, Larry." Um, and honestly, I just had like a really hard like two years, like just crazy stuff back to back to back. Um, and I think that was those are words that I've had to live by, you know, to try to like keep going. Um, so that that was kind of how it ended up being that. Oh, he's got the mic. Gavin, this is the first time I've seen your work here at Outbursts, and I love it. Oh, thank and you. When I look at your work, I think you're 50 years older than you actually are for some reason. I don't know. But I also think you are like, are like, a, like a set designer. You have this theatricalness of, you, you know, of what you do. But then in looking at pictures like this, it's the exact opposite of what is projected here in Outburst. There's narratives and people and history. And you said nostalgia. But there's got to be a thread 
between just the pure facades of what you see in LA right. and the messages here. Do, are you imagining nostalgia narratives and characters in the exhibition that we see here? Is there persons living and going through situations that are evident and behind the scenes of what is displayed here? It seems like an absent, there's some, some kind of quiet absence right. that is implicit, but we just don't know, but maybe you know. Yeah, damn, that was a, that was a good He's question. Good. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, one, and not to, and I, I'm only saying this uh, <laughs> because I don't know how, you know, I feel very uh, grateful for what you had to say about the work and, and me. Um, I, I guess I to one to one part of that, which was more of a statement. Uh, I, even as a kid, I can't lie. I was always the guy who didn't want to go ding dong ditch because it might have been somebody's like grandfather or something asleep or whatever. I, anyways, I've always been told that I'm an old soul, um, <laughs> and I don't know if that's like you know just something that I was born with or you know growing up in the household that I did that did that to me but um I uh um uh, but as but to the question um yeah there's definitely narrative in it for sure narrative um there's memory uh there's definitely nostalgia um I, I guess like a lot of that stuff I, I guess something I wanted to do with this show was to not give too many answers like this work um that's up on the screen um and and, and that's partly a challenge for myself you know I, obviously there's things at times that i've painted that I, I guess i do hope the viewer gets or sees um but i, I kind of wanted to step away from that with this work um and uh kind of leave it up you know, like leave it up to people's imagination, like what was going on. I hope that answers that. Thank you. We have another one right here. Well, hello. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Thank you for sharing. Um, I just want to say your humbleness just shines through. So thank you for that. And your brilliance also shines through. As a professor, though, I have to ask a question. <laughs> and I think you know the question I'm going to ask. So you were at your thesis. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm also a mama, OK? Uh -huh. So oh, I'm a man. mama. I hope okay? my mom isn't watching right now. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I applaud the fact because my son is an artist as well, and um, he, for years, refused to um, do traditional education, and um, but thank God now he's that um, doing his MFA in dance as well. Oh, congrats. But um, have you ever thought about going back, or is it something you think you might want to do, or? I'm not going to ask why you dropped out. Oh no! Well, to, uh, no, no. Well, I ended. Up, I did end up going back. Oh, wonderful. partly uh, a mother's tears oh, <laughs> will, yeah. will will get you to go back to school. Um, I uh, so I, I ended up I ended up dropping out. Um, right, I said I was taking a break, but I didn't really intend on going back to school. <laughs> and then, uh, honestly, one of my first shows that I was in. My mom came to New Orleans and I swear she came to like cuss me out and like <laughs> cry at me. And she took me out to lunch the day after the show and did just that. Um, rightfully so. I understand where she was coming from in that moment. Um, but I, I did go back and I honestly maybe only went back because they ended up offering a, mass, a, a lesser degree. So I was in a four plus one master's program. And at the time I couldn't get a bachelor's degree. I could only get the master's. So when I dropped out, I basically had nothing um, to show for the four, four and a half years I was in school. But then they ended up creating a bachelor program a couple years later. So about like three years after I dropped out, I ended up going back. But honestly, uh, 
if it wasn't for Roseanne Adderley, I believe she's the head of the African Diaspora Studies Department at Tulane, um, and Patrick Godby, who's now deceased, he was, uh, I think Patrick played guitar or bass um, in, a, in a, a hardcore band in the 80s, early 90s called Dresden 45. Those two people um, got me to graduation and getting a bachelor degree. Uh, so I, I, had, I had some angels in my corner. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and Patrick was, was a, I don't know why I'm telling you guys this, but beyond him being in a band, he was an academic advisor at Tulane. And he... I want to come back to um, the interior that you've created at the end of the museum. In some of your work, you have all of this life that that is around and yet here there's it it's not the absence of life it's it's the essence of the hint of life uh, I've spent a lot of time in inner city Los Angeles and as you walk past each of those things you're at a restaurant or you're at a tire store or you're at someplace so earlier you said you intentionally tried to pull back but as I look at this piece and as I walk through the pieces up above, this reeks of humanity. But the humanity is, is behind each of the pieces that is there. It's a different scenario, a different place, a different group of people, a different language, a different vibration. So was that part of your intent? Because it, this, even though you don't see life, this throbs with life. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, didn't, I, I cannot take credit for it in the same way. I guess like in this in the through the words that you just spoke um but i did have that intention while i was making the work um i think part of my fascination with not using the figure was using recognizable um i guess recognizable motifs um i guess that 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 takes space in this show by way of like i guess like their physicality and like uh in in the real world and in the gallery um, and, and I think in a, in a way, um, yeah, uh, sorry. I like that's, that's a, that, that question kind of got it, me. It's kind of a lot of comments. You, I think you, you no, no, you, you, you can, you can agree. No, no, no. I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree. But also, um, I, uh, yeah, that was definitely a part of it. Um, and, and like, like I, like the other, the other gentleman that, that had a question earlier, um, you know, I think part of, and something, and you know, actually the reason why I started off with this joke about Abex painting <clears throat> was not, not just during the, the time that I had working in the museum, but also from my other experiences just being a spectator in museums. You know, I've, uh, a, lo a lot of times, I think the everyday patron of a museum that maybe just goes once a year and isn't a collector or artist or adjacent to the art world um and and i honestly got to hear it a lot while i was working in the gallery um while people were walking through other shows and i could hear them talking about the work and there there, there oftentimes is a lot of confusion because there is you know not necessarily walls built up between viewer and art but there is, you know, like these sort of like imaginative walls built up that, you know, I know we might get, um, or I know I get because I've read the art, I've read the books or like watched the documentaries and I'm a painter myself. Um, but something that I, I guess, you know, like myself and some of my peers have been talking about while we've been making work, um, if, if there is an intention in it is using things from the places that we've grown up S similar to how people used recognizable imagery in pop art um i think like we're kind of doing that I, I think we did it naturally by way of being educated from afar by artists that i mentioned like barry mcgee you know mark bradford um but yeah so anyways it, it's definitely in there um and you know like i said while like some of my older work has a bit more figuration and text in it that I feel like guides the narrative a little more. I think, uh, like I said, this, I wanted to, I wanted the viewer to be able to come up with 
uh, like with their own narrative or story to what's going on. Let's have one more question just because we're over time. We also... Um, we're live streaming, so we need you to talk into the microphone. I'll be right there. <laughs> you might have to throw it. No. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't She's do got that. this. <laughs> I'm getting my steps in today. <clears throat> Hi, uh, hey. I'm a member of the uh, docent body here, and so we come in contact with our visitors. And I wondered if there was something personal that you'd like to have us uh, include, like just something when we're we're going through the gallery, and something like you say, "I really like to paint," or "I like the texture," or just something personal. Anything you'd like to communicate, because we're out there talking to folk. Yeah, no, I mean, texture is a big, big one. And I don't know if it was you that I ran into a, a week or two ago, um, but I did mention to someone that is, that's a docent that I would like to get you guys a write-up or something, you know, just like a little little writing that I did about the work yeah. um, so Can, that y'all could have some context. Ma for the making work. it personal, oh, yeah. yeah we, we really would love that because yeah. that's what we're trying to do is, is make unique experience and being personal is, you know, human right. beings love stories. You could tell them about the okay. Ayala, yeah. the secret. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I don't know if I included it in the slideshow, but there is like one cool little thing in the, in I guess to the left, uh, I guess if this kept going and the wall and we were in the gallery um, to the left of the fence of the white fence, there's a uh, there's a vinyl banner at the top left corner of the piece that says Ayala tire and rims, I think, or rims and tires. Uh, you, I guess that's like a good a, a kind of a cool one. Um, so Mario Ayala, who's one of my studio mates or building mates um, and, and also like a big reason why I even got a studio in LA in the first place. Um, I, I don't know if it was him uh, or Alfonso who also works out of our building, um, but somebody started doing like, kind of like including each other in each other's paintings. Um, I know Alfonso did it a couple times with, I know he did it with Mario in a painting. And then Mario started doing these small works where he, he has, it's kind of codified. I don't know if everybody will get it, but they're um, they're sort of like these recreations of of like parking signs, like tow tow away parking signs. But in each in each one, he's got little like special hints to uh, to like his buddies and stuff. So, anyways, that's one thing that I did. That's kind of like a cool little th little tidbit in the painting. So the Ayala's tire and rims is really a little. That was a little surprise or like a ode to Mario. Um, and yeah, that's great. All right, so we will have Jessica, because okay. you are Jessica, you Gotta get to get ask Jessica in here. Okay, so you mentioned that you didn't, you put painting aside when you fished, right? Mm -hmm. And you might, you were fishing two months at a time? Yes, sometimes a little more. Okay, so could you talk to us a little, little bit about what it's like painting uh, the sea when in your paintings? because they're so strong in your mermaid painting. Oh, wow, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> damn, uh, shoot, I don't know how to respond to that. Um, thank you, um, that means a lot. Uh, yeah, and I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure why, but for a while, like I said, I, I didn't paint the ocean. I kind of shied away, like straight away from it on purpose for some reason. I don't know if I was like scared to do to paint something that was so close to me for a while, um, but uh, yeah, you know, like this painting here came before the mermaid piece, and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I when I was sketching up the the when I was working on the sketch for the piece. Um, I don't really know what drove me to put the wave right there, but I was thinking about love 
I don't want to, this is going to sound like really corny and cheesy, but I was thinking about love um, and love over, especially loving a partner over time. Um, and I, I felt like the ocean and a wave would be a really great backdrop or metaphor for that. Um, and like I said, I don't feel like I'm inventing the wheel or anything by saying that, but, you know, having the portrait of me and my, of me and Savannah in the foreground holding each other, you know, like if that portrait was just on a blank background, you don't really get the full, you don't get the full scope of love through that. Um, so for me having like the kind of like big gnarly wave breaking in the background, um, sort of symbolized, I guess, like an honesty in, in painting our portrait together, um, which a lot of the elements of this painting do for me. Um, you know, even like the American flag, sorry to segue, but like I didn't want to paint the American flag because I have conflicted views about the flag and what it represents to the world. Um, but then I'm also like innately a part of that because this is where I was born, uh, where I make my art. Uh, where I exp where I have spent so much time in the ocean, um, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been kind of a trip painting the ocean. I kind of love it, I like it a lot. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was wonderful, Devin. Thank you so much. And and Devin will be upstairs um, in the reception where you can bird dog him and. Ask some questions there. No. Thank, oh, you. Please, Thank you. you please feel free to ask questions upstairs. So, thank you guys so much. <laughs>